I gravitate toward, I'm attracted to, community-based programs that build partnerships with their participants. The programs serve well, plant seeds, build capacity, and inspire copying. Medical, professional, or larger companies have a more challenging time serving, planting, building, and inspiring. Perhaps it's a function of community-based and partnerships with lived experience experts. I thank Dorothy Cuccinelli, last episode's guest, for introducing Kai Hellman and the Youth Clubhouses at the Mental Health Association of Columbia Green Counties. Youth clubhouses are drop-in centers for youth and young adults in recovery from or at risk of developing a substance use disorder. These programs provide recovery supports, including peer support, as well as skill building and community engagement opportunities, educational and vocational support, recreational and pro-social activities, family engagement activities, and sessions on health and wellness. Youth programs are programs of the New York State OASAS. OASAS stands for the New York State Office of Addiction Services and Supports, which oversees one of the nation's largest substance use disorder systems of care. Approximately 1,700 prevention, treatment, and recovery programs serve over 680,000 individuals per year. Kai Hellman invited Paul Taylor and Thebes Potter to join us. We spoke about youth access to the clubhouse, clubhouse partnerships in their communities, youth engagement and leadership, peer support, and harm reduction. We will end the episode with two tributes, one of mighty Casey Quinlan, who died a couple of weeks ago, and to my son, Mike Funk, who would have been 47 on May 17th. Welcome to Health Hats, the podcast. I'm Danny Van Leeuwen, a two-legged, cisgender, old white man of privilege who knows a little bit about a lot of health care and a lot about very little. We will listen and learn about what it takes to adjust to life's realities in the awesome circus of health care. Let's make some sense of all of this. Like what you're reading, hearing, or watching? Please support us on Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash health hats. One word. Link in the show notes. Membership benefits will include subscriber-only on mic episodes, your name on the producer wall on my website, MP3s of me playing the sax, invitations to live Zoom chats, personal calls, and coaching and mentoring with me. Thank you. Greetings. Thank you very much for joining us today. I have uh, three guests with me, and I think I will let you introduce yourselves and maybe tell us briefly, when did you first realize health was fragile? Paul, you want to start? Sure. My name's Paul. I'm the Director of Communications and Development for the Mental Health Association. I just started in the spring with the agency, trying to really put a good spotlight on mental health for the community and build up some of our agency resources and how we interact with the community. Healthcare is definitely something that is fragile with everyone, especially with the pandemic and the way that's taken a toll on everyone for 
their health and well-being and the way we approach our livelihood has really become something that is very important to overcome for the communities. Thank you. That's the Mental Health Association of Columbia Green Counties in upstate New York. Okay. Phoebe, do you want to go next? Sure. Hey, Phoebe Potter. I work with the Youth Clubhouses at the Mental Health Association of Columbia Green. And so that's working with young adults and 12 to 18 year olds on both prevention and recovery support. And recognizing health as fragile is, is, is the reason we exist. What's really important, I think part of the fragility, and we don't always think about this enough, is how interconnected all the aspects of health are from social health to spiritual health to physical health to mental health as if they're all they're not so separate they all affect one another so if one part of your life is going hard it can hit all the others so we really try to think about our approach holistically in that regard thank you thank you kai all right hello Kai Hellman, the director of the Youth Clubhouses of Columbia Green under the Mental Health Association, Columbia Green County. Oh, I think the question was, when did you first realize that mental health was fragile? I'll take it to a more personal answer in terms of, I, I think I was always, as a young person growing up, I was always the quote unquote sensitive one. And I think I had insight into health and mental health differently than maybe the parents expected <laughs> where mental health was, you know, is and was stigmatized in ways we don't talk about it, but I always wanted to. So personally, I think from a young age, just recognize it in myself and other people. Hmm. Well, thank you. So, Clubhouse. So, is that the name of a program that the association provides? Can you tell us a little bit about that program? Yeah, sure. The Youth Clubhouses are part of a chain of clubhouses throughout New York State funded by the Office of Addiction and Support Services. Not sure how many clubhouses are out there right now, but over 20, whereas when we started, there was seven in 2017. And as Phoebe's explained, it's a, a space for young people at risk or in recovery of some sort to have a space I want to say a safe space or a brave space to exist. So is that a, a physical space, a virtual space, both? Both. Both. Yep. Okay. We've we were strictly physical until the pandemic, and as many agencies have done, created a virtual space as well. And now we continue that virtual space. Is this for the young people alone, or is it for the young people and their families? Who's the service for? Yeah, I can step in. So it's really centering the young person. It's, we really take a person-centered approach. When a young person walks through our doors, we ask for very little information from them, and we really tell them out, out of the gate, confidentiality is something where you're going to have honored and respected here. So in terms of the clubhouse itself, family does come through. Like we have plenty of folks who are comfortable with our staff and friendly. We'll come in and say, I'm picking up my kid and say hello. But there's also other kids who are going there to get away from hard family dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so that's a very different relationship. So that's our priority. You know, Kai did collaborate with some other organizations or programs, even just within MHA to bring on Strengthening Families, which is a program that's being offered not not necessarily at the clubhouse when it's open hours for the kids, but separately mm -hmm. for families to ident be identified to come in with a young person and work through family challenges as needed. So there is family-based work happening at MHA mm -hmm. in a much larger way. The clubhouse, though, really is, is you know the youth first, and what are they saying? Mm -hmm. 
my own. But we can also help families out with things like gas cards and just like little supports like that too. Mm-hmm. You know, again, if the kids struggle in transportation, we text or call up mom and we brainstorm collaboratively. So th- we seek those healthy relationships with the full family. How long has this program been going on? We were funded in 2017, so it's been a good solid five years. Wow. Yep. And how do you, how does somebody access your your program? Like, how do they hear about it? How do they, yeah, what's the... What's the process of people walking through your real or virtual door? Very low thresholds. As Phoebe explained, no paperwork, no process, no referral form, strictly drop-in center. They might, word of mouth is actually the best way Mm -hmm. Um, because we have social media, we put out flyers, things like that collaborate with other organizations and youth programs, but word of mouth is by far the best way of engagement. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd add the physical location makes a huge difference too. In some ways, the clubhouse in Catskill especially is the community center for youth, uh, especially since the town run community center did close down. A lot of kids, I love Kai telling the story when they first opened, there was a line almost like around the block of young kids just stoked to know there's a place with some internet and some couches and food and that they could just be themselves and come. Right. MHA is supporting a really huge need in the community by, by having this program. So that, to me, that is both wonderful and scary. It's wonderful that it's a a service that's needed and wanted and used. And it's scary that um, whatever was there before closed, that it's there. It seems like the, do you guys feel like you're, that the need is greater than you can provide? I I don't know if I'm asking that right, but you know what I'm saying? You know, there's always the capacity and need balance. Absolutely. Um, Yes, yes. And what first comes to mind for me is that, yes, we're centrally located right now in Catskill and Hudson. But we are rural counties. Columbia and Green are rural counties. And then so we're missing out on from one end to the county to the other is an hour, sometimes an hour and a half almost Mm -hmm. um, in transportation. And we just can't meet the need there. Right. Yeah. I don't feel like one program is ever going to meet everyone's needs because everyone's needs are so diverse and different. And so we try and losing the youth center served a different need. A lot of times our kids are actually trying to petition right now to get access back to the back basketball court that was part of that which is now oh, okay. owned but not being used so like if our kids still even though they have clubhouse are regularly speaking about how they're missing these other spaces and so we try to collaborate with other organizations in the community too that are willing to open their doors to youth and find i happily will direct a kid out of clubhouse to a different space if it's a better fit so we're trying yes. to partner in. so that's a good that's a nice segue. So it seems, yeah, so you're providing, I was going to say a niche, but I don't want to, I don't want that to be a minimization, but you're providing a certain service and people need an array of services. And you've mentioned some of them that you try to provide, which is a safe space, some, some, peer support, some family support. And then I'm sure there's and gas cards. That's a different kind of support. And then there's medical support. And then there's there's just all kinds of so how does the how do you do that coordinate with like maybe schools and clinics and treatment facilities is Like, how does that happen? 
Paul, you want to take a stab at that? Sure. So with the Mental Health Association, we have a very vast amount of programs and services available. The agency over the past 12 years or so has grown exponentially above and beyond just mental health, mental illness, having all of these additional programs to help our community really with their total physical well-being as well as their mental health, because it's all, as we were saying earlier, intertwined. So we have things like our children's case management program that gets involved with all of the different preventative and behavioral health needs of children out there, children that have maybe been through the system and maybe struggling with different needs of behavioral problems, maybe they're acting out and so forth to help them advance as well. We have a child advocacy center that deals with victims of abuse and neglect cases and so forth. We have mobile crisis teams as well that interact with the community. So when it comes to that education piece that we provide and interacting with different providers and the schools and so forth, we really provide that education piece. We have our teams between mobile crisis and child advocacy center typically are very much in the schools providing education, support, resources to the students and the faculty, depending on the needs for addressing different health care needs, and especially with mental health mm-hmm. for the communities. Wow. So how are the people that you support and engage with involved in program design, governance, evaluation. How are they involved with those things? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question because that's the crux of Clubhouse. It's written right in the mission statement from Oasis that it's youth-led and youth leadership drives what the priorities are. We're structured to have both an advisory committee that's youth and community members Mm -hmm. who are aware of what's going on with Clubhouse and invested in our work. But really, our youth are, and we tell them this every day, and that's part of their personal growth of feeling empowered and starting to experience and learn the life skills of, hey, going from I want something to how do I get there and and achieve that? And and what does it feel like for a young person to be in a space where there's resources to help them get there versus just feeling shut down? Mm -hmm. So it's a huge growth and learning experience for them. But we have... There's, I don't know that there's a program or a field trip we brought on at Clubhouse that the youth didn't voice some interest or desire to see happening. Down to our scheduling, if we stay open on holidays, all these questions are first vetted through our youth leadership team. And then our staff work around what we can do with that. Um, and we are actually one of, we were the first program to actually find opportunities to hire youth to be paid to take on even larger leadership responsibilities within the clubhouse. And that's been really powerful. A lot of times youth, once they hit 15, 16, they drop out of program because they need to work. Mm -hmm. Um, So to have that integrated has kept our youth present with us and just, just allows us to say, Hey, help us do the outreach in the community to get more kids in the door. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, yeah, it's crucial to what we do they're driving the work. Now a word about our sponsor, Abridge. Record your healthcare conversations with doctors and other clinicians with Abridge. Push the big pink button and record. Read the transcripts or listen to clips when you get home. Check out the app at abridge.com. A-B-R-I-D-G-E dot com or download it on the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. Let me know how it went. So I'm doing this series, right, on on young adults with mental illness. And I've started the series, like I haven't published anything yet. I've done, I don't know eight or nine different interviews. And I'm trying to 
rooted in lived experience. So I'm interviewing people in their mid to late 20s who are on the other side, not so much the other side of they still are dealing with what they're dealing with, but they have um, some reflective, you know, they can reflect on what happened while they were younger and more in crisis. And the things that they talk about, so I'm speaking for them, which is really dangerous, but they talk about like feeling like it's okay to say something's not right and I, something's going on. I need help. They talk about having how important it was to have a glimmer of hope while they were going through crisis. And then having, being able to develop tools in their toolbox to deal with one of the reasons they think they're on the other side, so to speak, is they have at least a couple of tools for everything that happens to them. So if the first thing doesn't work, they got another thing to try and that that makes them feel more confident. And then they're in more of a position to give back because they feel safer with themselves. I'm saying that because when I talk to, so I'm also talking to people who are like administrators of inpatient programs or our ED emergency department physicians or primary care. And I was going to say they don't really think about that, which is not true. They do. They're more thinking about I want to be able to handle as much as I can handle because there's so few places for that for people to go and get the help that I can't provide. So I, I guess my question is, what do you think I should be asking them as I explore more about this this important? group of people who, God, we need our, I'm old and my day is over. And I haven't like really figured out that much in my 70 years. And so it's the young people who got the energy and new ideas and it's, okay. So anyway, that's my little soapbox, but yeah. So what do you think what do you think that either that group of people need to know or I should be asking them as I interview the wider community of people who are interacting with young adults with mental illness? What do you think? Take a stab. I think just what comes to mind for me is it's more of a, a conversation back and forth because, you know, every day I think we learn just as much from the youth and their present experiences than, than we might give back to them. Okay. And so it's really more of an ongoing conversation um, flow where you're just like taking and giving to each other. That's what comes to mind for me. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. What do you think, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. And so much of it is peer support based where with Clubhouse and we also have other peer support services where it's really about that shared life experiences and being able to find value and supporting each other. And hey, I've been through it. This is where I was able to develop from that and it helps support the other person as well. So asking the questions and like Kai was saying about having that conversation, what's in it for you? What do you, what is it that you need? What do you find value in? How can we help support you? How can we do something different and find that mutual shared understanding? Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
like in a way, this is going to sound wrong. I'll just say it. And in a way, what, there's a real difference to me talking with people with lived experience and talking to the support world in that talking to the support world is really depressing. And I feel like a hopelessness. On the other hand, when I talk to the some young adults and I've talked to some parents and I'm talking to you guys who are providing that immediate support, it feels way more hopeful. So when I think about the system in general, you know, I can just go down these rabbit holes of, oh my God, we're nowhere. We're absolutely nowhere. How do we pay for this? How do we, you know, how do we integrate it? There's not enough people like professionals and support people. They're just, there's just not enough. The waiting lists are incredible. You know, so I guess get, oh my God, how's this ever going to change? How's some investor going to make a lot of money on this? They're not. But again, when I talk to, and maybe my sample is skewed because I'm talking to people who have had success. And when I talk to like a primary care physician who says, yeah, there's people who have success, but there's so many that haven't. And that that one, one primary care doc I talked to, and she said, it just weighs on me that I wish I could have done more, but it went nowhere. So anyway, I I don't know what kind of reaction I'm expecting <laughs> for, for think, that. But yes, yeah. Kai, do you have a thought about oh, that? Yeah, I think that's the beauty of Oasis creating the clubhouses. There's the systems of care, the traditional systems of care, treatment, these formal systems. And then there's now these clubhouses where they're doing something different than they have before. Mm-hmm. And it gives us this space and this freedom and this creativity to flow and meet people where they're at, which it's just common sense uh, that it's happening and that we're able to do this and really support people and empower people. I don't, yeah. What should I be asking you or what should we be talking about that I'm like, we haven't about this wonderful area of work that you're doing? One thing that pops to my mind in this conversation is we really are at Clubhouse trying to connect a systems level conversation that you're right, can be like very difficult (laughs) and hard to have with that youth lived experience to say how do you know how do you all become the empowered voice of the future for what these systems need to be and look like and we run a program with the young people called harm reduction heroes so trying to get them to understand harm reduction as a philosophy within systems and structures Mm -hmm. and then and, and they're learning it at a personal level. What does it mean to practice harm reduction in my own life? But then also, what does it mean to build a world, a society, a culture where harm reduction is how we react to people in need, which mm-hmm. is the systems question. And we, one of our heroes is the advocate. And so we, on election day, we happen to be meeting the Monday before. So we walked through who was on the ballot and then had them break into teams and run mock governor campaign speeches and mm-hmm. just come up with their own ideas for what systems change or what they would want to see or what would help them through the context mm-hmm. of, of wanting this goal of harm reduction in the mental health and substance abuse worlds and in general, I think mm-hmm. for me. Um, so that's the fun, I don't know, a fun yeah, yeah. piece of our work. Yeah. And they've talked to county legislators before. MHA holds different advocacy opportunities. I don't know if the kids have gone for that, but I know they've gone to Albany at least once before. So there's neat ways those conversations can connect because I think you're right. Like the, the inspiration lives more in the young people who are navigating the systems than it does with the people who've been in it for decades entrenched and just are like, it's, 
it's not changing. It's not we are, we're so limited in our and institutions are limited and often not for lack of care to your point. It's not that the people aren't thinking about these other factors, but they're not set up systemically to be mm-hmm. able to do them. And the flexibility youth clubhouses has created for us Mm -hmm. to be able to look holistically at a person's needs and meet them in that bigger picture to say a kid going to see a good movie on a field trip night's as important as their counseling session because if they didn't do that they wouldn't have shown up to their counseling session and Mm -hmm. connecting the dots in the system um, Mm -hmm. responsivity is like the academic term that i think about with this work right it's one you can't address people's needs if you're not asking what makes them responsive to treatment Mm -hmm. what makes them able to show up Um, Mm -hmm. you're not going to get anywhere so yeah, I appreciate your soapbox, Danny. It resonates. Okay. With <laughs> Thank you. Hey, Paul, just um, tell the the listeners what's Oasis. Kai, you want to take that? I got that. That's more in your warehouse. It, yeah, yeah. It's the state organization that oversees clubhouse when traditionally treatment centers for substance use disorder. It's the Office of Alcohol. No, sorry, they changed their name. <laughs> I always get caught up. Office of Addiction Supports and Services. Okay, okay, thank you. They nicely changed their name from a less stigmatizing name previously. <laughs> so my last thing was when, I don't know, one of you sent me a link to Clubhouse Radio. And I looked at that. So could one of you tell us a little bit about Clubhouse Radio? Sure. I'd love to. That was my entree into the Clubhouse four years ago. It was that I, I had actually been working at the Pressville Arts Center up in the far northern part of Greene County, also working with youth, but was in transition. And um, I connected with the folks at Wave Farm Tom and Gallen, and they wanted more youth programming on the air. And so we talked to Kai and said, could Clubhouse be a a home base for that? And yeah, we set that up. And so that was my role at first was just facilitating that program and the whole vision. And I had a a co-teacher at Kingston who came in and got the whole program off the ground too. So I'll give him credit. Yeah. And it was just a space for the for what we we're talking about for all these like really deep insights and perspectives of youth to be part of the conversation going on in the public about what we do about our health crises, but also a space for them to just learn how to use a soundboard and use equipment mm-hmm. and be responsible for being on air every Friday at six p.m. Now, a prime spot for three years they've gone strong so we have two youth every week who are the host and the sound engineer and they're set and then they invite other youth in as guests or we have community guests and at first I took up we took a structured approach to the program it was we would do music one we'd have a topic for three weeks we do music one of those weeks and then we do kind of poetry and creative writing and then a political more social discussion but Mm -hmm. over time we just let go of and like the adults perception of the structure that would work and just mm-hmm. let them define their own structures and ways and sometimes the most insightful things they say are just like random thoughts between music they decided to play so mm-hmm. i really have come to embrace its sort of open structure my role at this point is literally just like sitting back and making sure that they're making plans for a show and sending them research snippets mm-hmm. they really have run with it and grown tremendously through that and i yeah just for anyone listen to clubhouse radio it can be a little all over the place but i just find like i said there's these nuggets of wisdom just nestled Mm -hmm. all through it and it's a really beautiful way to just hear what's what matters to young people right what are they into what's motivating them what are their aspirations for the future and that tells us a lot about then what they need to be it is really, I find, again, I'm a two-legged cisgender old white man of privilege, and I I sit in many seats as a patient caregiver stakeholder, and I feel mostly I know enough to be dangerous, and it's really a challenge to keep my ear to the ground. I really appreciate 
you know, what you're saying about listening is not easy. <laughs> and then doing something with what you hear is even harder. My, my hat's off to you guys. Thank you very much. This has been great. This has been really wonderful. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank it's you. Really Thank you for pleasure. having us. Take yeah, care. And there were definitely, I just have to say, there were definitely a few points that I def didn't <clears throat> mention regarding our young adults and our certified recovery peer advocates and the Narcan trainings that we do. So there were pieces. Go right ahead. Say something about them. <laughs> so we focused a lot on our youth program, which we tend to do because there's always so much going on. But in addition, our young adult program is 18 and up. And we have two certified recovery peer advocates that are able to work with people one-on-one -on -one and in group settings and field trips. And very similar to our youth programming, instead of the prevention aspect, it's really more in the recovery aspect. Because at that point, when you're 18 and up, you tend to settle into, yeah, I'm a person in recovery, or I'm a person struggling with addiction, or things like that. <clears throat> so we have those programs available through the youth clubhouse. We're set up in the Greene County Jail right now doing some groups. One of our SERPAs is in there doing excellent work. So we're in both counties do, doing the thing. And want to mention the Narcan trainings, all of Clubhouse staff. First of all, I try to hire all Clubhouse staff as people with lived experience, whether it be mental health, disability, recovery, whatever, all of the things that make us human. So always trying to hire lived experience, people with lived experience. And then oh, I got myself lost on what I was saying. Mm -hmm. Narcan, going towards Narcan, our youth and all staff are trained in Narcan from the onset. So that and we're trained to train. So we train the community. We can train young people that come in. We can train adults. We train programs. We, we, and all of our youth peer leaders are also trained to train. So we have right now eight youth peer leaders on our payroll, and they are all trained to train their peers and adults. Oh, that's great. And community events. They've had great success doing that. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. This has been wonderful. Thank Have you. Have a good holiday. All right. You too. You too. Thank you so much. See what I mean by my attraction for community-based programs that build partnerships with their participants? The programs serve well, plant seeds, build capacity, and inspire copying. We heard from another such national program when I interviewed Betsy Cowan Neptune in July of 2022 about BUILD, self-confidence, agency, engagement, and young adults. Perhaps the episode with Matt Neal, high school teacher, about their ambassador program is also such a community, school-based program. What can be copied from these programs? Well, not their flavor or culture, those are hyper-local. Can you copy community will, collaboration with those served, experimentation, and humility? Those feel organic. Can corporate structure be copied? One is a school, one statewide and government-sponsored, and the other private and national. Can we generalize about leadership or technologies? Well, we need humble, visionary leaders I didn't hear much about technologies, except for Clubhouse Radio, and I was thinking more about app technology. I'm stumped.
For those of you who consumed the April 1st, 2023 episode 193, The Mighty Mouse Goes Quiet, Casey Quinlan mashup 2021-22, to I have the bittersweet news that Casey Quinlan died on April 25th. Bitter because I'm sad. Sweet because she was ready. Here's what our mutual friend Colin Hung said in tribute. On April 25, 2023, the world lost a bright flame. After a long journey with cancer, Casey Quinlan, at Mighty Casey, passed away peacefully with family and friends by her side. She was a one of a kind, and if you had the good fortune to meet her in person or interact with her online, she undoubtedly left an impression. She's one of the few people who had zero qualms about speaking her mind, and that is one of the reasons I admired her. Colin goes on, I got to know Quinlan through the early hashtag HCLDR tweet chats that we hosted and still host on Tuesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. At the time, I had never seen somebody who was so forthright and direct when expressing healthcare opinions. No matter the topic, Casey had piercing insights to share. Casey was an outspoken advocate for better health care. She advocated for many improvements, including more patient involvement in care decisions, improved access to data, better privacy protection, more accountability from providers, payers, and employers, medication affordability, and more patient-led innovation. She was a true believer in the phrase, nothing about me without me. Casey never minced words and was almost always spot on in her assessment of the situation. I'll never forget sitting beside her in breakout sessions and hearing her both heckle the presenter when they made incorrect and aiding statements and praise them when they said something insightful. She definitely leaned into her reputation as a loudmouth, and those of us who knew her loved her for it. In addition to her strong advocacy and speaking truth to power, Casey was well known for the tattoo of a QR code on her chest. The QR code was linked to a website where she had documented her medical history and her advanced directives. You can read more you can read more about why she did it here. Why I got a QR code tattooed on my sternum. Link in the show notes. The tattoo was quintessential Casey. With it, she took the power away from healthcare institution and placed it firmly where she believed it should be, with herself as patient. Her QR code was a not-so-subtle way to stick it to the entire healthcare ecosystem that was too slow and too disinterested in solving access problems for patients. You can see the QR code in this photo from 2015. Michael Funk was son, brother, friend to us for 11 years, from age 15 to 26, when he died from complications of melanoma. It's Mike Funk's birthday, 47th birthday, today, May 17th, as I'm producing. A film strip in my mind is running, with laughing, crying, perplexing, disgusting, loving scenes. A film strip A film strip seems so two-dimensional, while he was so four-dimensional, if not five-dimensional. I'm grateful to have been part of his life for those 11 years. He changed my life. I miss him deeply. I host, write, record, edit, engineer, and produce Health Hats, the podcast, with production assistance from Kayla Nelson, from website and social media consultation and managing dissemination, 
plus Leon Van Leeuwen for transcript editing. Joey Van Leeuwen supplies musical support, especially for the podcast intro and outro. I play Barry Sachs on some episodes alone or with the Lechuga Fresca Latin Band. I'm grateful to you who have the most critical roles as listeners, readers, and watchers. Please subscribe and contribute on Patreon. Help me keep the lights on and out of my retirement funds. See the show notes, previous podcasts, and other resources through my website, health-hats.com, and my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at dvanlu, D-V-A-N-L-E-E-U. Link in the show notes. If you like it, share it. See you around the block.